Okay, I've got uh, CRT hooked up. For clarity's sake, I pulled out a 10 BP4 CRT so you could go see what was going on better before I hook up the one that's actually in that set. There's only five connections you need. Grid one, grid two, filament one, filament two, and cathode. So those are those five leads you see here. Going over to my toaster, the first thing you want to do is put on filament set and adjust the filament control to get this needle on 6.3 volts, which is what this model or this type of CRT wants. Next, check for shorts. Good, good, and cut off. The idea here is you should be able to adjust this cutoff control and get this be able to adjust this and then get it into the black box. What that means is that when you modulate the grid with a video signal you're going to have good contrast if when you move that control that uh, needle moves around. And then finally emission. Now I already know that this picture tube is a bit old and it's been sitting around for a while so the emission's not so hot. Um, so when you test this, you put it on emission, wait for the reading to stabilize and you push this button and if it starts dropping, that means you, you well, it's kind of vague but it means it's, it only has a limited life left. If it stays rock solid, you're good to go for a while. So I already know when I push the button on this one, it's going to start dropping and dropping. But this is one of those tubes that's been was sitting around for decades. When I first got this tube, it's from my Admiral 20X122. It, uh, it barely registered at all, and it seems like the longer I let this run, um, the better it, and the stronger it reads. Something else you can do is this filament voltage. You can actually crank it up to, say, 7, 8 volts and let it run for a few hours. That's sort of a very mild... Uh, method of uh, rejuvenating the cathode. I'll just leave it at 6.3 for a while. I don't know. I mean, as I've been talking, this needle has been slowly creeping up. Um, just touching the good now. Uh, so let me hook up the uh, CRT that just came with this set and let's see if it's any good. Alrighty, I've got this CRT hooked up. The filament is glowing. You can't see it because of the light of this camera. Turning it off, you probably still can't see it glowing, but it is glowing, trust me. That's always a good sign. And I've got the same uh, settings for emission like we just saw, and just like the other tube, this one is slowly, slowly climbing as we watch. So I'll need to let this run for a while to see what finally stabilizes. The other tests are all fine. Um, shorts, no shorts, shorts. Cut off. I have that grid control, so that's, that's just dandy. And back to emission. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that this is the 10 BP4, and that's the 10 FP4. 10 BP4 tube needs something called an ion trap, which fits on the tube like so, and needs to be adjusted in just the right spot. What this is for is if you can see inside the tube, that's the actual uh, you know, electron gun that emits electrons towards the picture tube. Well, it's cut, out, it's cut at an angle, and inside I believe it's even a more acute angle. So the electrons are actually shooting off at an angle and actually will exit the neck of the tube before it even hits the phosphor on the face. The reason they did that is that in addition to electrons, you also get some ions coming out of that gun. If those ions hit the phosphor, they will wear it out and actually turn uh, turn what's normally whitish, uh, kind of brownish color, and dramatically reduce the life of the CRT. So what they do is they shoot the electrons and the ions out towards the side of the gun, and they use this, which is actually a couple magnets, to bend the electrons back towards the center of the picture tube. The ions, being heavier, aren't deflected as easily, and they continue to shoot out the side of the tube. Now the 10 FP4 doesn't need that because it's aluminized and I'm not going to get into the exact physics of that right now but the, there's a, an aluminized faceplate that prevents the ion burn essentially. Uh, so no, no, uh, 
new ion trap are needed with that. One thing I did notice too when I pulled this out is that the focus coil was just kind of flopping around on here and uh, this was loose and I just pulled it out. I imagine this is supposed to be wedged under that focus coil I'll keep it tightly in position so I'll have to have some fun figuring out that. Emissions creep crept up a little bit but uh, like I said I'll need to cook this for a while maybe increase the voltage a bit but hey you know it's certainly not a dead tube and that's the most important thing yeah even when a tube is just reading right in the middle like this you really need to actually just put it in a functioning set to see what uh, you know how good it really looks and you know if the tube doesn't look that good and this is the best reading I can get there's always a rejuvenate function which on this is a lot nicer um, Especially when you use the auto restore because that has safeguards in place so you won't like, blow out the filament or uh, fry the cathode. I've gone and pulled the chassis out of the cabinet so we can get a better look at the underside and see if uh, there's any visible damage. So far I haven't picked up on anything that looks bad. Uh, a few of these capacitors are kind of deteriorated looking but uh, Wax capacitors always look like that with age, and these will all need to be replaced before this set can be used for any extended period of time. Also up here is a little selenium rectifier. Those uh, should also be replaced, because when they go bad, uh, it smells uh, horrendously, I've heard. I've never actually experienced it, and I never hope to, but these should definitely be replaced. Just a couple uh, generic silicon diodes will work, especially in this case because it's only for low voltage on one of the filament supplies. On the bottom of the cabinet I also discovered one of the feet has been knocked off. Uh, it should have one of these wooden blocks here. It's no big deal. And I'll be putting felt pads on the bottom uh, of this set like I mentioned in one of my other videos. Top side. Also looks to be in good shape. All the tubes are present and accounted for, and that hole I noticed before is not uh, anything to be concerned about. There's the high voltage flyback. That's the bit that actually generates the high voltage in here. You can see the lead going to the pitcher tube. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, speaking of pitcher tubes, is underneath are some metal fingers that extend from the chassis to the uh, bell of the pitcher tube. This pitcher tube is actually uh, covered in a conductive coating called Aquadag. And those fingers uh, ground that shielding, um, which in effect actually forms a capacitor for the high voltage, which helps filter out any noise in it to give you a clearer picture. Ugh, but and yeah, everything else looks to be okay. Uh, all the tubes should be individually checked uh, for sure. What I'm going to do now, or next rather, is to. Uh, just temporarily power up part of this set. Uh, you would never want to just plug one of these sets in and leave it running for any length of time, but uh, if you do it in stages and use a few precautions, it's not such a bad idea when the set looks to be okay cosmetically, because you can find out if any parts are fried. Now we already know the picture tube is good, but this next check will tell me if the power transformer is any good. And then we can move on to checking the high voltage circuitry. Those are the three main things you, you'd want, you might be concerned or you should be concerned about with a TV because they're the most expensive and hardest to track down replacement for. It's a pitcher tube, the power transformer, and then the high voltage circuitry. So hang on and I will replace that damaged power connector.